Welcome back to SwitchCast. We are here with you again, as we are every week, usually live, but not tonight. Tonight we have a pre-recorded episode as we have a very special guest. I shouldn't say that. All of our guests are special, but this one may be a little more exciting for some of you as you uh, will know who he is. It is none other than my friend Ed Bolian, founder of VinWiki, the app and the YouTube channel, host of Car Trek, and one-time Cannonball record holder. Uh, Ed has been my friend for about six or seven years. Been very privileged to know him and have him as a uh, influence in my life, sometimes positive, sometimes, uh, well, I don't want to say negative, but he does push me towards some shenanigans. He's a <laughs> devil on the shoulder often, uh, but uh, it, it's really been a, a good time getting to know him, and I'm happy that he let me and Arnie take his Cannonball record, but uh, he's been an incredible influence on the Cannonball community, a uh, mentor to many, many people, a solid source of encouragement, and of course, uh, chock full of wisdom and entertainment in his stories. Uh, we only had about an hour with him as we both had an incredibly busy schedule. And actually, our producer was on a time crunch to fly home. Uh, but Ed has a way with words, as maybe I do. So there are a lot of words coming up in the next hour. Uh, so uh, pay attention, listen closely, and I think you'll be edified and entertained. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing how you guys like the episode. I think it was a great one, and I hope you enjoy. All right. Starting in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> you're a terrible person. And you're... <laughs> If only your Yet, friends knew the things you say about them. <laughs> Yet you continue. Welcome back to SwitchCast. <laughs> you continue to open your house to me. Is it, is it because of the commercial gain? <laughs> There's two locked doors between here and my children, Doug. <laughs> oh, come it. on. Graham loves me. Uh, He's been asking about what kind of Hot Wheels track we're building. Ooh, oh, yeah. I'm excited. He's, he's excited. We got to do really it. We gotta I, I was nervous that he was asking what kind of Hot Wheels... Mr. Doug brought because that would that's right he's packing light he's pa it's drift school it's drift school <sighs> I don't pack light you should just ask Arnie I pack very heavy yeah I think I brought three bags with me but that was also because of the podcast equipment so that's right yeah this you... is quite a production if you don't know this is... <laughs> yes this production is sponsored by Boxcast which makes it so easy that we're broadcasting with an iPhone but yet I still have to bring lots of bags thank but, you boxcast yes uh, <laughs> all right so yeah this is this is ed he needs no introduction but why don't you <laughs> like michael scott he deserves <laughs> no introduction much more accurate <laughs> uh yeah he is he is uh he was the cannonball record holder until he introduced me to arnie uh he is the founder of vin wiki he was a exotic used car salesman uh snake oil sale i mean sorry snake salesman not the oil that's right you yeah. keep them alive we didn't milk them for the oil milk. how do you get snake oil like actual is that i a think it's real pressed, thing like an olive so is is that a real thing or is no. it just a phrase it's just an oil that's attributed to snake. i think you can soak a snake in some oils they do that in a lot of asian countries and you could it doesn't solve any problems but they sell it as though it would like ceramic <laughs> coatings <laughs> that's extra funny because ethan our podcast producer works for nathan's detailing who is also a sponsor of the we i think you've even been sponsored by ceramic oh, coating absolutely. companies yeah no but, I mean, ceramic coatings are yes, real they they do they are real things, but we, <laughs> yeah <laughs> unlike snake oil which is not real. it's not it's not oil and it's are not they snake. good what? yeah uh yes, yes. Okay, yeah. back we like our we like our sponsors <laughs> ceramic coating better than your sponsors ceramic coating, so we won't talk about. It. I like Nathan quite a lot. Yeah, he's a good guy. That's great. He's a Christian, uh, so you should love him. I, I do love him, but I, <laughs> I I'm, love comes in a lot of forms, and some people pay me other ways to love them, I, and so we love Glosset too. For what is worth, I don't think I've ever <laughs> paid. Well, this isn't Vin Wiki. This is Switchcast. So. This is Switchcast. Yes. Um, so yeah, that got beeped out, but it's. <laughs> Anyway, Ed, who needs no introduction, he, uh, <laughs> I think I already gave it. Anyway, um, Ed, Ed Bullion is, uh, let's see, he's a host of Car Trek. 
Cannonball Run record holder at one time. Yes. Um, for a long time. Longer than us so far. So far, yes. But you, and um, counting. And counting, yes. Um, it, although, according to TikTok, that I, I know you don't watch Switchcast, so I won't assume that you, you have. I but, watch it more than TikTok, so what's about <laughs> to happen here? There was a, some guy on TikTok who is very famous, no idea who he is, but um, he... You've seen the Cannonball Run records over time, right? Somebody made that graph Mm -hmm. um, of EV versus motorcycle versus cars. And some guy got on there and was like, oh, man, this is this is really incredible. And he basically just said nothing. He looked at the graph and said nothing other than, wow, I, I this is amazing. And in the last couple of years, like the records have gotten really faster, like 22 hours. And he also couldn't understand why cars were faster than motorcycles because motorcycles could lane split. So you're just completely clueless about the whole thing. But I read the comments and when Arnie was on the podcast, I went through all the comments and just kind of let him react which to them. Which is the best they were, way to approach the internet. Start with the comments. Start it's with the where comments. where the wisdom is. Which ironically, Ed always says to anybody on VinWiki, don't read the comments about yourself. It might commit you to a mental institution. Mark Spence has never been the same <laughs> since being on VinWiki. Um, but it's positive for Mark Spence. I mean, it's really been. Actually, most of the comments are. I mean, it's it's what he wants to be. Um, so the man who will fight your dog in a trailer park, (laughs) um, the, the comments were great, but the the biggest, the the funniest thing was the sense of confusion that COVID brought to cannonball. Nobody knew who the record holder was anymore. You know, if, if you delineated it down to, to yeah, I know because Honestly, your name came up more than anything in the comments. People think you hold the record still. As they should. Just read the internet. Uh, um, people right. thought Steve Brown held the record with the 250-gallon yeah, fuel cell. The, the guy up. in the rental Mustang came up a few times. But, uh, yeah, it was it was, it was was quite a dumpster fire in, in terms of that. But uh, all that to say, yes, Arnie and I do hold the record. It's partly Ed's fault for introducing us. Um, but... Your legacy does live on. In all seriousness, we do a lot of trash talk. Uh, we know it was difficult for you to, you know, release the crown of holding the record. It is certainly a defining moment in anyone's life to to get a cannonball record. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I think COVID certainly diluted that quite a bit. Um, it took something away from the accomplishment, both in. I, I don't think it did in Cannonballer's eyes, but it did in the public's eyes. And whether or not we like to admit it, we do it a little bit for public attention. <laughs> um, we can be honest about such things here. Yes. Safe space. Right. Right. Um, so take me back just a little bit. Take not me. I have I know the history, but take everybody else back um, to. So you, you have in Wiki, you are on car track. You're very much a public figure now. Um but you've always been a car guy. You didn't set out necessarily to achieve this. Well, you did set out to achieve a cannonball record since high school, but you didn't necessarily set out to be a YouTuber or have car fame. Although I think all of us from childhood dream of being Jeremy Clarkson and Richard Hammond and, or or in some way being an automotive journalist and being paid to drive cars around. Absolutely. Um, Take us back and into the journey of how, you got from from there to here sure yeah i mean i found cannonball to be the right way i felt for me to express my love for cars to my very close sphere of influence i never saw it as a way or a platform to be famous because it really wasn't even a precedent for that i mean obviously alex roy had a following when i could start to learn about that and obviously richard rollings developed it but if you looked at that it was mostly due to finding, flipping, and fixing cars. It was just anecdotally mentioning Cannonball. And so that wasn't the basis for anybody ever being famous, Bronk Yates included. And so I thought that the ultimate outcome would be to have a really cool magazine article that I could frame and put on the wall of the office at whatever normal job I had to have for the rest of my life. And so the idea of like going pro in cars was really never a thought. I thought it would always be a hobby. But I started the rental car company just because I saw a market opportunity and didn't really think it would be that long of an experiment. It ended up being about five years here in Atlanta. And, you know, it worked really, really well. 
from 2006 when I started it till about 2010 as the economy declined because depreciation was just rampant amongst luxury assets. It was a really good time to offer an ownership alternative product. And that was awesome with the minor exception of the hyper consciousness to marginal cost of exotic car usage that came with it. When I'm selling essentially by the mile using cars, when you think about driving one 24 miles to dinner, it starts to be like, wow, well, that's going to be a lot of money. Like uh, that's yep. more than the dinner. And it, it even in a world today where generally cars are net positive because values are on the rise and I, I buy terrible wow. ones and I sell them less terribly. And, but in it, the last two years anyway, generally, exactly. but yeah, but we yeah, were making cars before repeatable. it was easy, right? You yeah. know, that's uh, <laughs> how about that? So I, I would say that that actually took a while to shake off and, uh, transitioning into sales, uh, you know, fortunately created the first time where I wasn't ending months with like $4 left net worth wise uh and so that was that was nice um and then i i enjoyed that for a while got a lot of fun stories to tell from it and then didn't really know what was next we launched the vinwiki app in 2016 me and a bunch of friends that had different kind of skill sets and i would say of all the behaviors that i've developed that was probably one of the best ones was just making it a habit of getting together with entrepreneurially minded people with very different skill sets and vinwiki was the outcome of that we had a guy who was a back-end developer a guy who was a lawyer an accountant and a whole bunch of different people front end and back end everything you know web and uh app developers and as we talked about and spitballed ideas around vinwiki the app in terms of a way for users to contribute to the history of a car was sort of the most immediately viable, deployable, actionable product. And deployable so, or deployable? deplorable? Not deplorable. Okay, no. so it's not a, a Trump voter. No, it's app. not. It was not. Uh, that would have been before Trump, which was nice. Yes, but right. the uh, no, it was not deplorable. <laughs> it was deployable. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. What is VinWiki? Because people ask me. Most people know VinWiki only as the YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> hey, it's Doug from VinWiki. I, well, I'm not in the app, but... Um, there you go. So VinWiki is a crowdsourcing vehicle history reporting platform. So it's kind of like a social version of Carfax. It's the largest publicly available automotive database on earth. And we have about 450,000 users now in the app. They can post anything they want to any car by its VIN or by its license plate. And what that allows it to be is a living and breathing historical timeline of what's happened to a car. Because anybody who has dealt with the transaction of a pre-owned car knows that, you know, Carfax and AutoCheck and things like that can be useful, but they're kind of like an SAT test score. Like, if it's really good, it means absolutely nothing. If it's bad, it kind of probably means something. And so you're looking at a lot of cars that everything that you could currently find or you could back in 2016 that would say this thing's fine to buy but the kinds of things that you might not find like whether it's been used in the commission of a crime or whether there's unreported accident damage that somehow didn't go in the carfax or auto check registry or anything like that or if it's a very rare car very special car things like that i knew from selling cars and you know this as well that the way you present a car's history totally changes the buyer's perception of whether something that's really bad is actually bad and whether something that's good is great enough to spend their money on. So how do you get around the obstacle of now that it's user-based, right? So Carfax is quote unquote independent. They're taking all information, good or bad. Uh, if it's user-based, so I ran into this, like, for example, with my Volkswagen Touareg as much as I was the original owner and had a long journey with the car, I didn't necessarily want to put it in VinWiki because I drove it hard. I did service it properly. I took it to the dealer. I did everything right. Um, but you know, I'm not going to post the time that I backed into somebody's, uh, garbage can and Small scratched, <laughs> yeah. scratch, scratch the rear fender. Cause that, isn't a good thing about it and and like that's a small thing but you uh, to extrapolate that out you have guys who wreck their career gts at, at the track and pay cash to fix them so that nobody will know about that and then the shops also are kind of under a, a gag order for political reasons they're not going to post it they're not going to rat they're not going to be a narc how do you get around that or or what how do you well, that is a hostility towards the truth getting out. And I, I think that, you know, we, we've had a few owners approach us with issues on things like that, that, you know, the picture they never thought would get out is on VinWiki now. And in reality, 
It never hurts. There is nothing true that can come out about the history of a car that will make it sell for less money because every buyer of a pre-owned car is haunted by their imagination that someone like you is out there as a winter beater driving the car into the ground and somehow cleaning it up and then making it available like it's a showroom perfect specimen switch cars primary inventory whatever you know that's that's exactly what they this think was my personal car for that's the record it. yeah it's all i did was church on sundays in this car and so many cars get presented that way that people are trained to disregard and distrust whatever they're told about a car and the less they have to use their imagination the better they feel even if what they learn is bad in my experience, that just makes it better. I, I disagree. I, I like I get the point, but I disagree. And I've seen too many examples where people have been told the truth, even if it's very, very minor, a, a scrape on the underside of the front bumper of a Ferrari that's easily touched up. And I say, here, here it is. We can easily fix that. And he goes and buys a car from somebody else that claims the front bumper has never been painted even though we all know it has. And it, like I could give you a, a hundred examples of that very same scenario to the point of, of one, one car I sold where I disclosed that it was not the original engine and the, I sold it to a dealer who then like the exact same buyer who didn't buy it from me, bought it from the other dealer for 10 grand more because they told him it was the original engine, <laughs> even though I had already told him it wasn't. Like people love being lied to when they buy a car. I disagree. I understand that there are certainly circumstances that would illustrate it, but the lifetime value of a customer is something that very few car dealers consider. And when I was selling cars, and I know your experience is similar, at least 75% of my business was repeat buyers. And so the value of a customer wasn't making five or 10 grand on a car. It was $100,000 in profit that I would find over the next few mm -hmm. years. And those customers do care about honesty and they are willing to overlook something that they might consider objectionable because they know that you will take the car back on trade. You'll represent it well to right. the next buyer. And I think that being overly honest, even to the point of things they don't need to know, it ends up creating much more lifetime customer value. Okay, Short -term I, I profit, agree with that from I, a relational standpoint in the specialty car industry. But again, how do you uh, how do you get that information? How do you motivate people, whether it's shops that are working on the cars, whether it's the owners themselves, to post that potentially damning or potentially negative information? about cars well that's a long-term educational process and, and certainly we're not there yet even with you know i think we have like i don't know 10 million posts or something like that we're still a long way from it becoming like cultural for people to post every bad thing that happens to their car but at the same time there are so many times where even now with 160 million cars in the database i'll look at a car yesterday i was looking at a 2014 rebuilt title uh, Cayenne GTS 2014 and it had a rebuilt title and it, I was like well I don't know does the guy know what it is he doesn't know there's a picture of the IAAI listing and a tree fell onto the fender broke the windshield broke the fender alright the car looks fine now there's mm -hmm. nothing it's, it's a great thing it's as good of an outcome from a rebuilt scenario because there was absolutely no chance that it was anything structural right. you could see the damage and it made the car Price like a bad Carfax car or value like a bad Carfax car will be priced like a rebuilt title car. And it's the ideal circumstance. And so there are so many times where if you just have the documentation, if you can just show what really happened, you overcome so much concern. Now, your examples are all in, they're expecting a car that is ready to go out to Cavalino tomorrow. And I'm telling them that it's still ready to go out to Cavalino tomorrow, but there was a moment in its life when it wasn't, and that's what they can't stand. I don't like those cars. I don't sell those cars. I don't drive those cars. I don't own those cars. So I own <laughs> the worst ones, and I love that because I never have to worry about a thing. 
Uh, I'm, I'm currently trying to buy, I think I'm going to have it bought, a car that is owned by a celebrity known for offensive body odor. <laughs> And I don't know who that is. Uh, so. yeah, yes. And so it's, is, uh, is, is it just one or are, are there many? I'm sure there are many, but that might develop the ambiguity around who it is. But I, I you know, I'll, I, I, I expect I have a it'll... pop culture IQ of seven. So <laughs> some might probably... argue that my entire IQ is close to that, but I didn't, he did. So I, I, I don't have a better popular culture IQ, but I, I can't tell you why this person's famous, but I know they are. And so that that's the kind of thing that, you know, sure, it, it becomes attached to the history of a car. But then when you experience the car in person, you say, yeah, it doesn't smell terrible. Game on. Hmm. Switchcast is brought to you by BoxCast. BoxCast is a live streaming company based in Cleveland, Ohio, and they serve broadcasters and viewers around the world. Their founders launched BoxCast back in 2013 with one purpose, to make people part of the experience. If you're looking to live stream your podcast, church service, car show, sporting event, your wedding, or even your cannonball attempt, BoxCast is an easy, flexible live streaming platform for organizations and individuals. BoxCast is so easy, we're broadcasting this from a phone. Head over to switchcars.com slash boxcast for your free trial. Again, it's switchcars.com slash boxcast for your free trial. Okay, so how does that, how does that impact the, probably my favorite VinWiki car? And it was around and known before VinWiki, but it's 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 chronicled now in VinWiki is the dead rapper Murcielago, yes. which if you haven't seen it, there's this newspaper clipping of this rapper who was, uh, you know, a legitimate Dead. businessman, but he was, he was shot and he was, um, at his, uh, his open casket funeral was a, it was, it was an open casket. door. It was an open door funeral. And, uh, yeah. So there's one photo of that and it has made the rounds of dealers and individuals and the, black and red interior has been changed out to black to somewhat erase the history and or the smell of formaldehyde but you know there's there's a definite value detraction for that car because of that but not all of the i think the current owner has no idea that he has the dead rapper mercy lago well he could <laughs> if he checked vinwiki and but really until I don't, it was never advertised as that. And so someone put the pieces together and documented that on VinWiki. And I, I'll be honest, that car is worth 20% more than an average 03 Mercy today. To you. To anybody. <laughs> to you. To, all right, to it, amongst imperfect cars. I'm not saying that okay, it is absolute. Fine. But if you were looking at the bottom third of 03 Mercies, which it certainly is within, you know, non original interior cars, things like that. Yes, it's worth more. Would you rather own the dead wrapper car or a normal one? Well, but you make money off of telling stories. No, so, I make money off selling the cars that are way more interesting to other people that want to tell the stories at Cars and Coffee. If you pull up in the car and you're like, <sighs> you know, oh, that's a really pretty mercy. Guess what? A dead guy at his funeral in it. How cool is that? I mean, people love that stuff. I wonder if you could get the original newspaper clipping for that you don't car. have to you google it dead rapper mercy oh no but Ed has no but to like put it on your oh, friggin windshield i'd, I'd wrap it in that just tile it over <laughs> i mean like, like if, absolutely i mean the first thing i would do is put the interior back to original and get a stuffed version of that guy to put in that cars and coffee if you had, yeah, absolutely <laughs> I mean, he would ride with me in the hov lane i mean <laughs> the whole time that uh, it's the new like people people are getting desperate for attention at cars and coffee now because paint to sample has become ubiquitous so it's like well, what do i do <laughs> and you've, you've created an entire new market for weird story cars that <laughs> it's the new we need to it's find the them. new flex that's it that's it <laughs> yeah, that that car was up for auction on on double clutch the wholesale website I, I sent it to you. It was like six months ago or a year ago. I mean, it wasn't super recent, but the guy wanted all the money. It, it's in Ohio. He knows what he's got. Uh, based on what he paid for it, I don't know if he did, but yeah, it's in it's, Ohio. It is. Yeah. yeah, it is in Ohio. So. Yeah. They, they, there are these people that make really realistic looking like dolls 
and I'm sure they could do the rapper. <laughs> I don't know those people, but I'm sure you do. Yeah. I don't want to ask why you know those people. I just know they exist. <laughs> Yes. Do you also have their W9? Nope. No, they're not a sponsor. <laughs> they're not a sponsor. I said W9. Their W9. How much have you paid to uh, them? The, uh, no, I, I didn't say 1099. He's, uh, he's not an accountant. Don't, don't think this is advice. <laughs> I didn't give advice. I'm asking you questions. Well, about the responsibility of my purchases. Is that it? <laughs> Nathan's Detailing is a proud sponsor of SwitchCast. Nathan's Detailing is a company in Cleveland, Ohio that provides mobile detailing services for individuals and dealerships. They also offer PPF and ceramic coating installations. With over 800 Google reviews and an impressive 4.9 star rating, Nathan's Detailing is the go-to shop for all of your detailing and protection needs. With Nathan's, convenience is key. Their mobile detailing technicians bring the power, water, and supplies to your home or work and detail your car on site. Check out the link in our description for free interior fabric protection or leather conditioning with your purchase. At Nathan's Detailing, this smiles for you. All right, so what questions do you have other than the obvious value of my application? <laughs> That's a good question. Have you monetized it yet? Nope. Wait, gotcha. Waiting for the right time. Waiting for the right time. Well, in a sense, you have based on the YouTube channel. But yeah, that was totally by accident. I mean, when, what most web developer, what most business owners fail to understand prior to getting into the business is what is my true cost of customer acquisition and the app business, not YouTube. Right? Any business yes. on earth. Okay. And, you know, I think that when yeah. you really. What you think is that I have this wonderful idea and I'm going to introduce it to the world and a butterfly is going to flap its wings in Kansas and a tidal wave is going to erupt in the Pacific Ocean and everybody's going to download it, everybody's going to buy it, everybody's going to use it. And that's not true. Because we think about that in the way of like, you know, I heard about Twitter and then everybody was tweeting or I heard about Instagram and then I had to have it. And, I, you know, that that happens, but that happens well after a critical mass of users has been reached right. and no one knows what that is nobody and remembers it, google plus that's right or cnn plus and what <laughs> exactly and so when you think about the the cost from a marketing perspective of taking your business from it exists to somebody thinks it's going viral that cost is huge and what I realized when we launched the VinWiki app is that, I don't know, I had maybe 10,000 followers on Instagram and I thought maybe they'd all use it. That was not correct. About 250 of them used it when I posted it. And you think that it's just going to grow. Everybody's going to tell their friends. They don't tell their friends. They don't feel like that because when they go on it, there's nobody using it. They don't know what to do. And so I knew that my cost of user acquisition within a short order of experimentation was about $5 a user. And... I didn't have $500,000 to get 100,000 users. And I knew even at 100,000 users, I didn't think we were going to be at a self-replicating position of user base in the app. And so I knew that we were going to have to cheat it somehow. And cheating it in 2016 was social media. And so in 2017, we launched the VinWiki YouTube channel, which I thought was going to be kind of a one-time experiment. Let's see if it works. Like certainly we couldn't sustain daily videos for a long time because I didn't know how to make videos. And, uh, you know, here we are. I remember are. you begging me and Art, not begging, but oh, no. inviting hey, me please, and Arnie. Doug, please <laughs> no. tell me how awesome you are. <laughs> you didn't know how awesome I, I was at that point. You told me a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, just Im inviting me and Arnie down to fill content. I invited Arnie. You asked to come. I, I was at a baseball game. I remember the invite. Glad you feel that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> it's how, been a how, lovely relationship. Yes, it has. Uh, lots of let's views. check your lots bank of... account for. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Pennies. Pennies have come. Oh yes. Uh huh. That's it. Sure. All those millions and millions of views. Anyway, uh, for which I thank you as well, um, because if I told the same stories on my own channel, they would inevitably suck and have twelve thousand total views. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting there. I'm excited. I'll say the growth has been impressive. Are you happy with it? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, honestly, I'm not. I'm not trying to be a YouTuber, and like, I don't. Uh, the YouTube 
thing, the algorithm, the game, the whatever, that that challenge is not one I want to solve. Um, and if I was trying to solve it, releasing hour and a half videos once a week is not the way to do it. Um, but I'm committed to the format of the podcast. I like it. It's, um, it's fun discussions with people I like, and I want to enrich the listeners in terms of uh, their automotive ownership experience. So, um, I, I, Excellent. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not interesting enough to become a full-time YouTuber and I don't want to try hard enough to be that interesting to be a full-time YouTuber. So I, well, I am happy either. with That's the, why you guys have to come over here and tell well, stories. Well, yeah. And you have found that's, it is accidentally brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. The, the, so you, you said it before I did, um, that you found the perfect way to be an automotive YouTuber because you're not a content creator yourself. And you've also said that really nobody that's on YouTube is that interesting to the point where they have something to offer the, the mass audience every single day. Um, so you've created a platform where your content comes to you. For and, sure. And that's because the stories that you tell, that anybody tells here, are the ones that deserve to be immortalized. They're the ones that deserve to have a whole lot more people than you could find across the table at a bar and tell them to. And that's been, to me, the personal treasure of Vinwiki is that so many stories that so much deserved far more audience or listenership than they ever could have found otherwise have been able to find it. And when you think about how you can address social media, regardless of the strategies that work, it comes down to what product are you proud of and what product can you replicate at a frequency that at least makes sense for it and one hour and a half video a week that is the product that you're proud of that you want the world to see and that is a very reasonable content output for any platform is perfect and so there will be there will be times that you see tremendous growth and there will be times where you see very small growth i mean right now vinwiki is in a smaller growth time where ten thousand new subscribers a month is average rather than 30 or 50,000 and that may go up it may not but I don't really care I mean at the end of the day I'm making a product that I am proud of and mo mo much more significantly the storytellers are proud of and it becomes something that that is helpful to them and that's been that's been the great thing and people still download the app at about one per thousand views yep so when uh, we first started talking about the app I think before you had launched the YouTube channel mm -hmm. um, I asked you about the monetization and you said your your goal with VinWiki as the app was to build it up and sell it to a company that could utilize it in a different way. That it probably wouldn't monetize on its own, but it was a you know supporting product to somebody like Carfax or a larger conglomeration. What what are your thoughts there? What do you see as the ideal use for your app? in the public marketplace. Yeah, then we messed all that up by making money on YouTube. <laughs> that was a real, real problem from that perspective. Because, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting. You know, normally when you start a tech company, you raise money in order to fund further development, in order to staff up, and because you can never make enough money off of the user base of something in order to staff it, to build, to find a bigger user base, right? Like that's mm -hmm. uh, effectively an impossible calculation. And that's why venture capital firms exist. That's why private equity investments exist. And so in general, that is what would happen. The problem is that we started to make money without making money and, and not a lot of money, but enough to pay me a salary and eventually hire an editor, which was amazing. And so it, it just, complicated things because we had line items of like sponsor revenue but not app advertiser revenue and line items of you know google money but not like a google investment fund like no just from adsense from youtube and so it it made that very very challenging and it has stagnated the app to be quite honest uh to a great extent but it's allowed it to continue to grow and to to let the users much more than we ever would have intended steer some of the behaviors, some of the expectations, some of the community of the app. I still think that like most apps, it won't be efficiently monetized under current leadership. 
I'm not opposed to it. You know, we've talked about building a marketplace or white labeling a more, you know, institutional data set or, you know, other subscription ideas and stuff like that. We would never, I don't think, charge for the user contributed data. That doesn't make sense. That never, nobody does that. Um, so the idea of VinWiki existing in its current form for free uh, to me seems valid in perpetuity. But I think there will be a time where we do find a better way to either offer hyper-targeted advertising at a, at a higher ad rate, obviously, because if you could advertise all the way down specifically to the VIN of a car, there's value there. Or that we're, that, you know, there's a pro-level access to, uh, you know, a broader data set, kind of like Epic VIN or, um, you know, mm -hmm. Carfax or anything like that. How many, uh, how many owners as a percentage are posting on there, identifying themselves as the owner of a car versus car spotters. That's interesting. I've, I, I, off the top of my head, I don't have the slightest clue. We have about 5,000 posts a day. So my guess is that they're probably 25% owners and 75% like sure. spotters or other people that see things. I mean, that, that would be the way quickly that I would see through to monetizing it in that way. Uh, you know, you would have to essentially be selling <laughs> the, you know, their information that, okay, this is the owner of the car. But from my perspective, like having a much smaller, very niche database of VINs uh, with GT Vault, mm -hmm. like the, the value there, if somebody was to buy it would be, oh my goodness, I have the contact information of, you know, 5% of all Porsche GT ownership so if i need to find this car the owner's in the database um so from a, a perspective of transactions you know especially right now where it's impossible to get inventory dealers would pay money for those types of direct leads sure that, sure. that would be my thought in terms of if you knew those numbers of who was who were the owners of the cars that were actually posting Correct. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, in that case, we've got to find a way to validate ownership, which at scale is impossibly annoying. Um, you know, if you can find something that says niche as that, or hopefully even more niche, because again, trying to find 10,000 owners of cars is tough. But I, yeah, I think there's a lot of ways that you can, you know, create value in a community of enthusiasts. And I mean, we see that every day in all forms of social media. But I, I would say that Yes, the the idea that we could over time, you know, build some really really useful portals like that, I mean, it's on the table. The problem with any kind of web or app development is that, you know, you build it, they update all the code bases, you try to update it, everything breaks, you go back to the old one, and you just say, well, I'll keep that one, and that's what happens over and over again because when you, you know, when you don't have a full time staff, when you have people who built it in their spare time, when this is the way you wrote code, this is what it was, you kind of end up with something that is not entirely serviceable, and you know, it's like what would happen to a McLaren F1 if you get rid of those computers, they, you know, ah, what do we do? And so, you know, that's, that's a little bit of a window into what, where VinWiki is right now. We probably should tear it all down and rebuild it, but that's a, you know, 500,000 or a million dollar calculation. And that's mm -hmm. something, not something I could afford and not something that really even makes sense necessarily for even 450,000 users. Like, you know, at some point when it's a million daily active, sure it does, but it won't break between now and then. And we'll just, you know, let it keep rolling. Sure. All right. Celebrity Machines is a proud sponsor of SwitchCast. Celebrity Machines offers more than 250 different screen accurate license plates as they appeared in movies and TV shows like Back to the Future, Ghostbusters, The Fast and the Furious, Breaking Bad, and so many more. Celebrity Machines also makes our dealer insert plates as well as our commemorative 2539 plates from the fastest cannonball run ever. If you're looking for a gift for somebody you like or for garage art for your own place, check out CelebrityMachines.com for more info and use promo code SWITCHCAST for a 25.39% discount at checkout. Again, go to CelebrityMachines.com and use discount code SWITCHCAST. On a personal note, I want to touch on something you said to me a while ago, and this is kind of a roundabout question, uh, but we were just discussing uh, market timing, you always have a different perspective on just about everything. You have a unique way of looking at the world and cars and finances. 
And you said a few years ago, of course, everything is off the table for the past two years in terms of values of things, in terms of people's net worths, car values, home values. It's just, you know, the, the, um, everything is, the book has been rewritten, but a few years ago, you said your net worth was largely attributable to when you were born because of essentially timing, right? You graduated college at the right time, um, and started making your normal investments in terms of buying a house for your family, buying cars, starting investing into the stock market when everything was down. Not necessarily as a genius play, just as a matter of, well, this is when I graduated. So you didn't take the massive hit that everybody did in 2009, but you benefited from all the gain. Absolutely. Um, Obviously, part of that is you still had to make those investments, right? That there's sure. people that probably graduated at the same time that did really stupid things with their money and you know didn't uh, benefit as well. Um, but you've also um, a significant portion of your net worth, I would say, is based on making money on personal cars. <laughs> I appreciate that you said significant rather than irresponsible. <laughs> I'm I'm a master of subtlety. Yes. Many people may disagree, but <laughs> yes. Thank you, Dave Ramsey. Uh, right. Yeah. So oh. <laughs> you you you've predicted my question. So I I feel like you uh you and I are like the personal versions of Dave Ramsey versus exotic car hacks. Exotic car hacks says leverage everything. Cars shouldn't cost you money. Here's the ones that are going up in value. Cars are great investments. You can use other people's money. It'll never cost you a dime. Dave Ramsey says pay cash for everything. Don't buy stupid things. I'm on the side of pay cash, be very responsible, conservative, et cetera, et cetera. You've done quite well. I won't I, I will say you're responsible. Leveraging a exotic car rental company is not responsible when you're in college, but it sort of worked. Yep. You kind of, you know, you paid your bills, you got out unscathed. You didn't you get go. rich from that, but nope. you didn't bankrupt yourself either. Yeah. But you made a comfortable living for a few years, learned a lot. Yes. Fair. Leveraging yourself on exotic cars in the last decade has landed you. A, a pretty penny in net worth. Correct. And would you say that that's repeatable? Would you say that that was somewhat luck? Would you say that that was because of your expertise in the car industry? The big question is, are cars actually investments or do you have to know what you're doing? I have never made money in a car as an investment. When you make money in a car, it is either... A traditional profit, wholesale to retail, an arbitrage, or an investment. And in almost all cases, I make money as an arbitrage. Meaning that I take a car from a limited market, and I take it to a broader market, and I profit because of that. I take a car where there are fewer competitors, and I put it in a place where there are more competitors, and I make money. Now, there's a lot of reasons why an arbitrage happens. It may be because you dig a car out of a barn that nobody else was going to go to. It may be because you bought a car that nobody else was willing to consider buying, and then you turned it into a car that only a few more people would consider buying, and you make money. And so... The YouTube audience certainly helps with that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's the same... I mean, when I bought a Lamborghini from a prostitute, and I just sold it as a used car in inventory... Mm -hmm. That's exactly the same thing. Nobody else is going to deal with that girl. Right. But I did, and I dealt with reconditioning the car. And at the end of the day, it's still a car. Is it a perfect example with no bad history? Of course not. It's got a minor on Carfax because somebody backed into her in a Wendy's drive through And it smelled like glitter. And so... <laughs> I, you know, there was a lot of stuff that you have to do. And I've had a lot of cars like that that were press cars or damaged cars or t branded title cars or whatever it is. But when you prove that they work, you make money. Now, that is 
in some ways it's a profit from like a wholesale version, but I'm, I wasn't necessarily buying them for inventory. I was buying them for personal use. When you buy mm-hmm. a car, put it in inventory because you know, you're getting it as a trade or you're covering a trade for someone else, or you're just buying a car from somebody who just doesn't want it anymore and doesn't want to deal with retail level marketing. When you sell it at a retail price, that is a totally legitimate, understood way to profit from a car. If you bought a 250 GTO for $8,000 in 1978, and then you set on it until it's $70 million today, that is appreciation. But when you take a car from a world where fewer people have access to it, and you put it into a world where pretty much anybody that cares to has access, that's an arbitrage, and that's exactly what I do. Sure. Sure. And you, well, you've also done a lot to increase the demand and the buyer uh, attraction. It's a reverse form of a roundabout version of arbitrage where you've c- created a larger market for things like the Murcielago manual LP 640s by establishing their rarity in more concrete form. He said that whole thing without using the word manipulate, and I appreciate you for it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, I I think that that is another thing that people can certainly grasp a hold of. Because, I mean, the crux of your question is, is anything about the way you buy cars something that the audience might learn from? And those are the two things. One is buy cars that are difficult to buy and take them to a place where they're easy for people to buy. You will make money. The other is stick with stuff you know. And I learned early on that my favorite car happened to be infinitely more rare than anyone had a clue for. And that was miraculous from a personal financial statement because I was able to buy the nicest one with zero dollars down and then i could tell the entire world how rare they were with the vins well and and it worked like <laughs> it worked well for you because of the timing of both the vin wiki app and the youtube channel and and things like that where you had an outlet but it also worked for you from a timing perspective of you were doing this before people really started to consider modern cars as investments. Now it is such a ubiquitous term that people are looking for any reason to put money in cars. And it is, I, I dare say ruin the hobbyist aspect of high end car ownership or even classic. I don't even want to see, say high end. Like there's a lot of old, mediocre cars whose values have gone through the roof because people are just chasing any possible opportunity and they've shifted their mindset to these cars as investments or investment opportunities and it's a lot harder to pull off that type of arbitrage sure now as opposed to when you started doing it that might be true but i think that there are a handful of like true market shifting moments over the past decade from from a car value perspective and so Mm -hmm. for me this was not an entirely original thought and i'm not here to say that it was but in 2014 at the amelia island concord elegance rm had an auction and a guy from Canada bought a 599 yep. for $682,000 mm-hmm. when in the room when everybody thought it was a 250 grand car i was laughing my head off at the idiocy i but obviously dude had 10 of them at home yeah i mean that that's not even like a question right it's, well cuz none of them have sold for that much since then other than a couple very very short mile examples exactly because yeah. you know they started to make sense cuz there was an, a crazy you know comparable and people decided to add one to the collection the next was that ferrari it, between the enzo and the la ferrari around 2012 or 13 decided that your allocation of a la ferrari would not be based on the number of new cars that you'd bought it would be based on the quality of your collection Mm. that decision that single thing doubled the value of more cars than i mean added billions of dollars in value to pre-owned ferraris Hmm. because all of a sudden people were buying 328s that were never going to drive a 328 in their life because they felt like they had to have them and they just started to build the vertical of every line 
And so things like that, things like the million dollar Periscopo, when Kuntosh's were 150 grand. Like, wait, there's one that's a million dollars. There is a million dollar Lamborghini on this planet? What? That was unheard of. And so things like that can change the world of car culture the same way that Ed putting a list of 23 VINs of manual USLP 640s did. And I'm not trying to take credit for it, but I'm saying that you, anybody, can do something right. that minor that can radically alter the path. Here, here's a good here's a good story of that. And, and that's not to say... That, with any market shifting moment or any anything that moves any market in any way, there's multiple causes. There's no one cause and effect. The news would like us to think that the stock market is up three points today because of this particular news announcement. It's absolute horse crap, right? There, the cause and effect is bigger than that. Um, however, there are things that contribute to that. And so from 2010 to 2015, cars went up in value because everything was recovering. The entire economy was recovering. They were undervalued, but there were certainly things that caused collector cars to go up in value more and outpace the economy. And one of those moments was an ego moment between two car dealers in Cleveland. But there were two car dealers with big enough bank accounts to shift the entire market. So one dealer, Motor Car Group or RH RH Motor Cars, had a had an air cooled collectible Porsche that Marshall Goldman wanted to buy. And Goldman asked for a number on this particular car and they wouldn't give it to him because they just they I don't know, they didn't want to sell it or they didn't want to sell it to a competitor. It doesn't matter. They just they wouldn't give him, give him a number, even an FU number. They just, they wouldn't give him a number. And so he said, well, screw you. I'm going to go out and buy every single perfect paperwork, rare option, collectible air cooled 911 I can and get another warehouse and stock them with it. And r was doing the same thing at the same time, just for their own edification. You had other people doing it as well. You had Michael Kelter, you had guys like that, but you had these two guys with massive bank rolls buying up every possible collectible air-cooled 911. That's gonna shift the market. All because if they had done the transaction, they just said, well, I gotta have 250 for this car. They probably said, ah, okay, maybe, yes, no and gone about their day yeah that makes all the sense in the world like i mean it doesn't take that many actors in order to to change the market i right. mean when you look at it like over the past 36 months most of the Countach and diablo transactions went through either roy Katz or curated because they both had effectively limitless checkbooks for inventory of decent or not, you know, Royal buy anything, Tamarian will buy the nicest stuff in the world. And, you know, it's, it's incredible what that can do to a marketplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Frustrating for the little guys like me who just want a Diablo. <laughs> We're happy to have Nuts for Sticks as a sponsor of SwitchCast. Nuts for Sticks is a fantastic merchandise site where you can get t-shirts car-related t-shirts that usually also have dad jokes and puns on them. They have a great selection of high-quality t-shirts there, so go check them out at nutsforsticks.com and use discount code SWITCHCAST for 10% off your entire order. Again, that's nutsforsticks.com, discount code SWITCHCAST. Are you going to get that Strozek car? Oh, gosh. Yeah, so I found a Strozek Diablo in um, A friend of mine Germany. found it and I told him about yeah, it. I'm sorry. Yes, That's you're right. right. Easy Park, there, Indiana Jones. I, brevity. <laughs> brevity. We, oh, we have limited time here. That's what you're known for. <laughs> do, I, do I need credit for finding a Diablo? This is not some grandiose search. A, a Diablo was found. Very by special Tom one. Forwarded me to... Yes, it's very special because it's burgundy on burgundy. It's a Strozek Diablo. I love 90s modified stuff. And uh, it's got some miles on it, which is good. That's right. Uh, it eliminates Tamarian as a possible buyer. And uh, yeah, but it's still too much money. It's in Germany. Got to bring it over. I don't know. That's I'm true. working on, it. The, I'm working on it. the dollar is strong against the euro. It is. It's That's right. almost even now. That's right. Yeah. That's amazing. That's good. It's a shopping spree time, right? Yep. 
the uh, you know when you think about massive market changes most of them make some sense right like they they do have some cause to point to sure the one that really doesn't is the 2013 change in the value of GT Porsches you had a good explanation for this which I think is right 918s were not really selling at all um <clears throat> yeah I, I was on porsche's blacklist and they i had multiple dealers invite me to place a deposit for 918 and they released the vip program whereby if you bought a 918 you would get first crack at any special car any porsche gt car they made in the future which was absolutely compelling but at the same time i saw it kind of like a ferrari move where, well, we're just going to play games now and you have to buy enough cars to buy more cars. And, you know, at the time that was ridiculous because new Ferraris certainly didn't appreciate. So why would I want to pay to buy a car that I thought was overpriced so I could buy more new cars that were going to go down in value? Because all the special Porsche GT cars went down in value. And your hypothesis was... That, the you know, as a manufacturer, they were faced with how do we create demand? for these cars that there is no demand for. At the time, obviously LaFerraris were sold out. P1s were kind of sold out. They were not sold out. They said they were, but when we needed one, one became available. Uh, but they were nowhere close to selling 918, 918s. And so they, they were faced with, all right, are we gonna put a rebate on these cars? Are we gonna not deliver all these cars? And what they realized, I think, was that the best way to increase the value of new cars is actually to increase the value of used cars. And I believe that there was some form of a dealer meeting where they said, we have this big pot of money that we were going to have to throw at 918s in order to get them sold. But what we would rather do is backstop your losses on go out and buy every Carrera GT and GT car you possibly can, ask the moon for it, make money. They're going up in value because we told you so. Have the inventory, ask the moon for it, and just see what happens. Because overnight, GT3 RSs went from maybe 90 grand for an 0708 car that with mm -hmm. some miles up to 120, 130, 40, 50, 200 before too terribly long. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't overnight to 200. It took a while, but yes, Curry it was, GTs it was a constant. doubled overnight. Yeah. I think that was the focus was certainly GT3 RS 40s went from 5 below sticker to 100 over very quickly. Exactly. Very quickly. And I've talked about this to some Porsche executives not critically out of the fascination of the ways that we market automobiles. Like it, it was a great play that 8 years later isn't abundantly clear how it happened and has still stuck. And so it was brilliant, whatever it was, but it was absolutely instigated. What, whatever the formula was, however it was done, it happened because Porsche said something. How did they keep it a secret, though? That's what I... Dealers can't keep secrets. Well, and that's a very like, good argument. But I, I would say that probably there weren't all that many dealers involved. And the ones that were involved were the ones that could Porsche keep it a secret. Porsche of North Houston, Buyers Imports... Uh, that Isringhausen, may be... Probably. Isringhausen... Yep. And so, yeah, these yeah. guys just all of a sudden bought every paint to sample car for no reason, like anybody cared back then, and, you know, paid whatever it took, asked way too much, and somehow eventually they weren't there anymore. Right. Well, and I guess if you only involve a few dealers, then you dry up the supply. So every other dealer is naturally just going to start paying more, like we're experiencing now. Anyway, every dealer is paying anything to get a a piece of inventory yeah it could have all been bought up by three dealers and stuck in warehouses and nobody knows but the reality is there is no supply so people are paying whatever they want and yes. i've i've certainly i've heard i've heard allegations allegations rumors i don't know I, I, uh, that there are dealers with thousands of used cars in warehouses that they're just releasing slowly because they want to continue to tie up the supply chain uh, yeah. not supply chain sorry tie up the the overall supply of used cars on the market yeah i'm sure that's valid and i'm sure there's manufacturers with them sitting in fields that they uh, there know. are yeah because yeah. it's working really Ohio. really well they're all more profitable now than they ever have right. been and there's no cars on the lots right how's that no, work? no floor plan yep yep on demand on demand inventory yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's definitely the case. Um, we've got a few minutes left before Ethan has to jump on a plane. Um, talk to us a little bit about Car Trek. That is the current uh, exciting moment in your life, it seems, uh, being able to go around. This is, I feel like it's the culmination of any car guy's dreams, right? Um, is being paid, whether it's a dollar or a million dollars, to drive exciting cars and you got to drive a mclaren f1 which is both of our ultimate unicorn car um so just talk about that how it came to be um and what you're enjoying about that and what's what's in the cards for car trek coming up yeah absolutely it all came about because me and freddie tavarish were sitting around my fireplace uh after he came by to tell some stories when he was on his way to deliver the Pimp My Ride van to Tyler Hoover. And that series of three videos that he had released at the end of 2019 has been the most successful automotive internet video series that has really ever happened. They all were like number one trending videos across YouTube. It was phenomenal, the outcome. And, you know, when you think about the ways that YouTube channels make money, it is through Google's ads that you'll see before in the middle or after a video. It's through sponsor deals and it's through merchandising. And it's mostly the first two. And and so we, we were kind of faced with this new reality that we could create at least a value case for a lot more budget from a sponsor placement perspective because there weren't any cable shows getting Super Bowl viewership numbers the way that this series was. And so if that was not lightning in a bottle and we could create multi-million view counts across a series of videos, then we could probably get enough money to play a little bit harder than we normally did. And I asked him, I said, why don't we do a Top Gear cheap car challenge? Like, honestly, we buy the cars anyway, and we probably make money on them most of the time. If we don't, it's not a lot of money to lose. All we really need to finance through the sponsor gig is the production. We didn't know how much that cost. Way more than you think it does. And we're probably at a point where we could ask somebody. And Auto Tempest was a sponsor of my channel, Hoovy's channel, and Tavarish's channel. And so we talked to them about it. We said, hey, look, we know this number won't make a lot of sense, but this is why we hope it'll make sense. And if you don't mind giving it a shot, we'll put in the effort and take the risks and go play Top Gear for a little while. And, and it was one of those situations where it was really something that we didn't, like, we could kind of do whatever we wanted. There wasn't like a guidebook from Auto Tempest. They weren't prescribing the challenge, even though we frame it that way. Uh, they were just willing to kind of be the producers. And the outcome was a whole lot of fun and something that was a little bit cringeworthy because we were obviously trying to be our heroes in it and we're hyper conscious of that like we're not I'm not apologizing for it like they let me do whatever I wanted obviously that was it like it would have been what you did too and so that's what we did and it got a lot of views and it's continued to get enough views that they keep writing checks we brought on Ticket Clinic as an additional sponsor and we're talking to some others and it's very different than a show would work on a Netflix or a network or a streaming service or anything like that because you know we shoot like six episodes in seven or eight days uh which is brutal and the, the everybody on the production staff hates it but it's the only way it works like well you know when we think about we are actually packaging it for a youtube audience like we can't take three weeks out of my life or their lives in order to do this and so yeah. we do it lean we do it cheap we don't make a lot of money but we have way more fun than we ever could have imagined we've released seven of them we shot the eighth already we're going to shoot the ninth and the tenth later this year and so each of them is is really it's not just playing top gear because we're not reviewing new cars or doing anything like that we we do it all as a car buying challenge which to me is the way i like to express my love of cars is buy a terrible car use it in an unexpected way it not work very well and then eventually it gets you where you need to go and you feel really good about it at the and end and then you sell it for a profit hey there we, that's it <laughs> that's it i do air quote arbitrage bullion <laughs> that's it that's it and so that's what car trek is and uh it is as much fun as it looks like uh maybe even a little more awesome thank well, you thanks ed it's been fun as it always is um 
Sorry that it was brief, but uh, the next time I can convince you to come back to Cleveland, I guess the last time I was getting married, so I don't know what I have to do to get you up there again, but we will don't do... Don't do that again. <laughs> no, I'm, try... I'm not a Mormon. Um... That <laughs> sorry, wasn't the I'm implication. Sorry. Fundamentalist Mormon. Can't, can't mix the two up. I don't think you're allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> they get very upset. Right. Uh, got, anyway, so plan, we'd love to do a live show with you. So I'd like um, that too people can call in and ask their questions because i'm sure people have many many uh so yeah look forward to having you on again and thank you for being here today thank you as well it's been a fun journey awesome well i hope all of you guys enjoyed that interview with ed as much as i did uh there was quite a bit of uh back and forth there i can never quite tell if Ed is messing with me or not. He is a brilliant mind, but uh, we had fun regardless, and we always do have fun. Uh, we will definitely have him back in the future for a live episode, and you guys can call in and harass him, and we'll have a lot of fun then. But uh, convincing Ed to come north to Cleveland is, is a pretty difficult endeavor. He's more of a shrewd negotiator than I am. So, um, the props, it's time now for the props and flops. Uh, the props and flops are brought to you by Switch Cars. Switch Cars is the enthusiasts dealership where we buy, sell, consign, service, and store cars that we like ourselves. Check out our handpicked inventory at switchcars.com. Our pick of the week from Switch Cars Inventory is a newly arrived 2014 Jaguar F-Type S in satellite gray. I always have had a soft spot for the F-Type from when they were first released. I like their predecessor as well, uh, but I thought the F-Type was an incredible redesign. This one is the V8 S Roadster, so it has an absolutely fantastic exhaust note uh, as I said the styling is is really nice and uh, it's just a great cruiser I don't know that it m gets much better than this for a two-seat sports touring convertible this car will be available on our website soon it has just 18 or 19,000 miles and is a very very clean example the flop of the week comes from the Corvette Buy Sell Trade Group on Facebook. This one is a constant state of entertainment. Most of the cars listed are incredibly overpriced, and of course, they are all rare. It's a, it is a breeding ground for my Corvette is best Corvette. However, one guy posted a Corvette C8 with 5,000 miles for just 90 grand, which is exactly what they're trading for at the Mannheim wholesale auctions. So this was a decent deal. However, the haters can't stand that any new Corvette is selling for more than sticker price, so they all went full lynch mob on him, and the average quote unquote offer in the comment section was 50 to 55 grand. Yep. You heard that right. 40% below market value, and these guys tried to justify it. And it was not just one guy, it was half a dozen. That seller could probably call up a dealer and get 85 grand for it today without the brain damage, but these guys wouldn't know a good deal if it hit them in the back like a Mustang losing control at Cars and Coffee. Our prop of the week comes from MotorTrend.com, and uh, <laughs> on the heels of my viral TikTok video hating on a kit car, um, our prop of the week is actually a kit car. Now, I don't have anything against kit cars themselves. I'm sitting next to an Aurora uh, Shelby Cobra replica. Uh, what I have a problem with is posers and liars and people who claim their kit cars are real in order to gain clout. That's never a good move move. But this kit car is a new one. It's actually based on a first or second gen Miata, and it uh, allows you to convert your Miata into a pre-war Alfa Romeo Tipo 154 race car replica. So this is uh, pretty cool. They're built in England, um, and it only costs about $10,000 to do this, plus your Miata donor car. And uh, it looks pretty stinking accurate. Barani wire wheels and a, uh, uh, yeah, uh, everything looks really, really good. Check it out. Um, and you could live out, as Motor Trend sa says, your Juan Manuel Fangio dreams with this, uh, this homebrew 
classic race car. Just don't try to convince anyone that it is a real Alpha 184 or I might come out and uh, shame you on TikTok. Anyway, thank you guys for all listening. Uh, I, uh, Like I said, I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. And we'll be back next week uh, with another guest. We're actually going to be down at the Crawford Auto Aviation Museum in Cleveland, Ohio, broadcasting live with the uh, recently hired curator of that incredible museum. So thanks again to Ed Bolian for being my guest. Thank you to our sponsors, BoxCast, Nuts for Sticks, Switch Cars, Celebrity Machines, and Stephen Holm Woodworking and Nathan's Detailing. Thank you to our producer, Ethan Huffnagel. Our bumper music has been provided by Emily and Ivory. You can stream their full album on Spotify or SoundCloud. This episode will be available Friday in audio format whenever you listen to podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. Not why I guess you can listen to it whenever. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next Wednesday at 8 p.m. as we look forward to answering your questions to help you on the drive of your life. <laughs>